I'm actually really excited for this because it's, not, it's like nothing you've ever seen here at Tribe. It will be a bit of a crazy next 45 minutes. So please indulge us, relax, sit back, and get ready for a bit of a wild ride. This is the contrarian argument. This is all about the thesis that payments will be the killer app for identity. Now, payments used to be about moving money, but that's not the case anymore. Because of security and regulation and compliance and digitization, payments is really more about authorization, validation, and authentication. It's not about money. It's about identity, you know what I mean? So where do we go with this? We've been talking about identity all week, and this is the discussion that'll kind of help shape the way we can start to think about this in future. And maybe we already have the mechanisms in place. Maybe we're already set and we're golden and there is no problem to solve. Or maybe we haven't even begun to uncrack and unpick the problem that identity actually is. So we shall be debating this. Now to give you an idea of how this will work, let me walk you through some of the rules. I will invite the following four people on stage. They will each draw a straw. They have no idea which side of the argument they're actually going to debate. Either their four payments is being the killer app, or they dispute the thesis. Again, they don't know which side they're arguing. Draw straws, sit down on the appropriate side of the stage, my friends, argue, and the talons will come out. Now here's the funny thing. Halfway through, there may be a little switch. The point of this is we're gonna cover every single point under the identity umbrella from every single angle. There are no rules, no one is friends on this stage, and no one cares about the outcome for the other people. This is not team, this is about the individual. And please keep in mind that these kind and loving souls and friends that I have bribed, they cost me a lot of money to do this, are not staking their institutional reputation on this, nor are they arguing for the party that they represent in terms of their career. They're here to help us unpack all of the nuance. So whatever comes out of their mouths is for educational purposes only and does not constitute policy. Fair? Fair. Let me welcome on stage, in order of troublemaking, the following people. Drew Graham from Barclays. Nikhil Kumar, who has his own venture, but actually was one of the original engineering members from the India stack. We've also got Emma Lindley, who you met on Monday for Women in Identity, and Gavin Littlejohn, who is the chairman of FData and representative of the industry for the Open Banking Initiatives. Please, my friends, come on stage, draw a straw, and we'll figure out exactly where we're going to kick it off. Please join me. All right, short straws together, long straws together. Let's see. Take a seat, long and short. I believe I belong <coughs> in the center. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, what happened before? We were on the same team. Now this is a first. Point. You're, you're, clearly, I engineered this. I'm really bitterly disappointed they're actually arguing the same side. You and I were wearing matching stuff, so we're supposed to be on the same team. Really? I don't know. I, I, I thought they were going to attack you first. <laughs> All right. Can we have our sides displayed, please? Because where they chose to sit will now determine where they start. Which side of the argument are they going to be going on? Pro, con, yes, no? Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Here we go. Emma, Nikhil, you actually believe that payments will be the killer app for identity. Oh, absolutely. That is your starting point. <laughs> yes. And I know you're excited about this, but my friend, just wait. Gavin, Drew, payments will never solve the problem. So let's point this out. Let's actually start with this. And let's start with a regulatory framework. Considering PSD2 has actually mandated secure customer authentication, SCA, those standards for payments are now set. Customers have to go through the process of identifying themselves for every single transaction they initiate. If they're already doing this, 
could we actually federate this as the identity mechanism? Nikhil, yes. I'll let you allow this, but just remember, my friends on this side vehemently oppose you. Kick it off, mate. Let's see how long you can go. All right. So I believe uh, you know payments is definitely a killer use case uh, for identity. It's because uh, if you think about the way we have designed our digital payment systems, uh, for a long time, uh, these payment systems were designed as payment switches. Uh, and it was only supposed to do a specific function of you know, debiting one's account and crediting someone else's account. Now, as we go along, because of identity uh, with mobile payments, mobile number has become the identity first factor of a lot of people. So that's your identity today. And with this mobile number, uh, for example, in UPI back in India, the Unified Payments Interface, um, it's a payments platform that the government of India and, and, and the regulator in India built. Uh, today we do around 922 million transactions, financial transactions, um, and move around 15 to 20 billion dollars every month in the country. And but let's, let's roll it back. The stats are impressive, but let's roll it back. The fact of the matter is identity is always a component of payments. I just, I just want to add to this. No, no, you're, the, I'm interrupting the, the, for a reason, my friend. There's a reason. For sure. Yeah, just you wait. Don't, don't pick a fight with games. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, identity is always a component of payments, right? But payments is just a singular fractional attribute Absolutely. of what identity is. So Absolutely. why do we think we can actually crack the conundrum, because, even if you're talking about scale? Because in India, while we do 900 million, 900 million transactions for payments, we actually do 3 billion transactions on check balances alone. So what I, what I want to argue is because we are able to identify a person, we're not just being able to deliver payments as a service to them, we're also able to deliver data as a service. The fact that I can use the same authentication infrastructure to send money to you, as well as access my bank account and my bank information oh, already oh, proves oh, that oh, payments oh, is actually oh, a oh, use oh, case oh. On, 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 on digital identity. As far as you're able to identify the person, you can get him to do payments, you can get him to do data. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So, exactly. needs volume. so what we know with uh, some of the schemes, digital identity schemes that have failed globally. So if we look at NSTIC in the States, if we look at Gov UK Verify in the UK, which you know, has, hasn't managed to get scale. The reason why they've not managed to get scale is because they haven't been able to engage with the private sector. They haven't been able to engage with private sector that has volume of transactions and payments has volume of transactions. If we look at countries where it has worked, so if we look at Sweden with Bank ID and Swish, absolutely 100% the volume of transactions of payments is enabled by identity and vice versa. So it is absolutely. Well, let's talk about the And today's world, payments is all about moving bits of data from one application to another application. You're actually building on top of an identity system something that enables the payments. It's not the other way around. So the killer app here is not payments. The killer app is that the built-in in the Nordics and the built-in India uh, proper identity system. Payments isn't going to solve it. Payments is going to make the problem worse. But, payment, but payments makes it work. So, for example, if, the, if so in the UK, GovUK Verify was only able to be used for government transactions. If you think about your government gateway password, you might only use that, that identity once a year, right? People forget about it. Identity and payments are intrinsically linked. They need payments to make them ubiquitous. So Let it is the killer app. 100% is the killer app. There's thing that nobody's actually answered your question. Exactly. The question was around SCA and what that means in terms of having to do authorization. Authorization is not identity. Authorization is a component of identity. Even yeah. authentication is a component. It's just a component. It's exactly. not the whole thing. But what's interesting is Nickel jumped into Adaha and UPI, but glossed over the fact that India, to get there, had to go through demonetization. They removed a friction-free, anonymous bearer instrument that had already solved payments. We've solved payments. It's called cash. You had to remove that and then put in place an infrastructure to try and do as good as cash. And whilst we're all a, rightfully a big fan of what's going on in India from a public sector standpoint, I don't think we can stand up here and argue that there wasn't some kind of downside of going through demonetization. And even when we start talking about SCA, what we're doing here is we are adding friction into the payment process. If we already have solved payments with cash, instant settlement, anonymous, a bearer instrument can't be tracked, how does 
adding a step into a payment process help the payment process? That is it only doesn't. in the case of UK or probably countries which don't have a good digital identity system. But it was the case Let in India. Let me take example of but it India. Was the case in India. Going back to because it, you it, it, it is because there is no good digital identity system which is seamless. To going back to Gavin's point on Aadhaar, which is the digital identity platform, the first killer use case was indeed payments. Aadhaar was designed for direct beneficiary transfer where your digital identity was your payment address. You're supposed today, to be arguing for, today, not against. Some of, the, some of the most marginalized people receive money into their bank account from the government of India because their identity is actually their payment address. If that payment was not done, the identity would have been never useful for that marginalized people. Here's so, the funny thing. I don't think we're actually debating the merit of the identity scheme married to the payment scheme. What we're actually saying is, have we solved already because payments has fundamentally addressed what identity is and we have nothing more to worry about? There are components of this. This is quite interesting when we go to cash because identity is irrelevant in, in a certain sense. It's a okay. tangible thing. So, yeah, the construct that was designed, the architecture design to deliver open banking creates surety between the regulated actors when data is transferred. So that one regulated actor, for example, a bank, can recognize that the fintech that's collecting the data is a regulated party and they've both been properly identified. They use software certificates to sign in and so forth. But it hasn't properly solved all the way out to the customer. We don't have a good identity system. Federating identity on top of payments, where you previously had KYC and anti-money laundering the customer, is building not quite a solid, building not quite on solid foundations. What we should do is extend the scope using the full architecture of OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect right the way out to the customer and build them into the architecture to prevent spoofing and phishing attacks so that you, you've got a custodianship of the, of the data all the way through the process. That's the way to build it not build it on top of a flaky start. Exactly, the point <laughs> is that identity as a platform isn't ready for payments. Talk to me with Adaha and EPI about consumer protection. Talk to me about reversible payments. Talk to me about refunds. Talk to me about settlement risk. If I want to just move money from one person to another, yes, absolutely it's there. But there's more to payments than just whether you're moving a uh, bearer instrument from one person to another person. Drew, you're talking like a banker now and adding all That's these no of risk. No, that is not <laughs> fair. So let's let's break this down, right? So what 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 does what happens when you are actually doing a digital payment, right? Essentially, you are identifying yourself with the custodian of your money, right? And when you're identifying yourself, essentially it's the identity which is underlying identity. It could be an identity provided by the bank, or it could be an identity provided by the sovereign, or it could even be a federated identity. But, but if you really think about it, essentially what you're trying to do is identify yourself with the custodian of the money so that they can perform an action on behalf of you. Uh, and it goes exactly back to the, back to the way you sign checks. Why do we sign checks? Because signing a check is nothing but an identity. People don't understand identity. They understand payments. You know, they, they, you know, and that's why it's intrinsically linked. You can, you can build identity on top of payment systems. The payment systems are already there. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why do you need something else? But I think you're making our point for us. Yes, payments and identity are intrinsically linked, absolutely. But identity as a platform, as a global platform as it exists in the world, is not ready for payments. In India, it works. But how do you then do that as a global construct? Payments but Drew, we've is been inherently using global. checks forever. When, yes. when you sign a check, you're essentially identifying yourself with a signature. How different is that from, but from what you do digitally today? that's element of payments. That check is then going to be presented. That's then going to go to the bank. That's then going to go to a clearing system. That's then going to end up being a ledger entry. That's then going to end up being settled over a three-day period. None of that's anything to do with identity. Why, Signing but it all doesn't of that is back do office function. payments with identity? It's only to reduce fraud, right? Otherwise, you could do it in every form of cash. In India, uh, the RDR was designed of course, to improve uh, tax yield and to take things out the black market. So we're talking here about simple fraud prevention. If 
I take over Nikhil's identity, I can continue to make payments because the system has now identified my persona as him. So it doesn't mean that I am him, it means that I've got access to re-authenticate with the process. Building on top of RR, which they did in India, means that you have the biometric identity established first and then building on the payments interface second. Not payments as the killer app, but identity is the killer yeah. as a platform. Identity, identity is, is, the is definitely the killer governance. app, but payments is the first killer use case for this particular application to be used. But actually, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a bastardization of the actual thesis, right? It's which comes first, chicken or egg? And in this case, it's identity scheme with payments on top, like Sweden and Swish. Yeah. No, or we if we looked think at you need identity to complete a payment. Give me an you, So if you look at the Netherlands, right? They have built the ideal network you know, for payments, and now they are able to build an identity network on the top of it, so payments came first in the Netherlands. But you've got success in other markets where identity came first, and let's point to India as the particular use case, identity granted payment rails now built on top with yeah. UPI. But here's the funny thing. We have already weak authentication methods, and actually de facto, card schemes are an intermediate ID solution. But, but, but here's the thing nobody tells you, right? So once we started the digital ID program in India, 600 million people were given digital IDs for the first six years, and there were zero transactions. Do you want to guess what the first transaction was? Payments. Payments. <laughs> Are you really expecting now for because all of the, the other sectors use case to use payments people as to receive money into their bank account, which is the, as your identity as the payment address, and second was your biometrics, which enabled you to withdraw money from these bank accounts. So if that killer use case, a daily active use case, was not there, the identity platform wouldn't be useful or as used as it is used and, today. And what happens in markets where we don't have a digital identity scheme? The, well, the, 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 the biggest baseline that we have is a payments trust infrastructure for in trust network. In a market network. where we don't have a digital identity scheme, payments happens anyway. Payments will happen whether there's an identity scheme or not. This is going, yeah. there, we don't require an identity scheme for payments to be able to happen. As well as talking about the bearer instruments, we can use the, the B word that we don't like using of Bitcoin, but you don't need an identity scheme in order to be able to do digital or electronic payments. You can have one without an identity scheme. The you can have a completely anonymous digital payment scheme. The two are intrinsically linked, but one of them is not necessarily a prerequisite for but, the other. But try the saying that to the regulators, Drew, because, you know, as, as a regulator, Bitcoin's not anonymous is either. It's because of privacy issues and the thought that building an identity scheme is going to invade my privacy. Well, frankly, but think about as we move increasingly onto a digital world, not okay. having an identity think that about you can carry with you is if, a non -starter. If you're not able to identify who's moving money, then you're opening up yourself to money laundering and there is no way for you to figure out who's bringing in money into the country and who's using that money for any other purpose. So is there a fundamental conflict between national security and the sacrifice of privacy, which is actually now codified? And what is the actual balance? Does payment provide that mechanism? Because to a certain extent, it's a surveillance, it's a surveillance mechanism at, at its finest. And, and, it goes and that is in the case of not enough enabling laws which prevent surveillance to happen. But in the case of if you have strong laws where it's purpose limited, then there is no way, uh, you know, it can be turned into a surveillance or a Brick Brother argument. Like if you have the right kind of Prevention of Money Laundering Act, for example, in India, we have a very strong PMLA, which is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, which clearly defines that for any digital payment or any KYC that happens, these are the prescribed methods of how one's identity needs to be verified before you approve a transaction. But here's a question. Fraud is a behavior. It may be attached to an identity, but it's a behavior. It's not necessarily an identity thing in and of itself. Mm. So where are we missing this? Well, actually, think... actually, the facts are that when you think about all of the other sectors that require identity and require the transfer of information, they're not all connected with a transactional payment. I might want to log in to find out what my pension value is. I might want to look at uh, my utility information. How often might, do you do so, that? How so often, often do you do that? Do, do that on a payment rail? I still don't get my pension. How are the Gavin, other sectors going to rely on others, another company's anti-money laundering? So Gavin, I mean, you, it's, it's you might joke. log in to look at your pension, often, <laughs> but I do not. You know, I'm, I'm making payments. She has a life. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a good example. <laughs> We're talking about what, what is being used by people every day. So if you think about exactly a toothbrush that. use case, 
uh, the, uh, the toothbrush use case for identity is actually payments. You authenticate yourself and verify yourself every day to pay somebody. You're not going to be authenticating yourself to open a new account every day. So what's the purpose of having an identity system if it can't? If you're going to use it once in a year or once in five years or once in ten years? And they can't trust it because there's no Why do you even need identity. an identity system if you're going to use it just to open accounts? It's not that identity and payments can't be used together. I think you've demonstrated rather loudly that they definitely Thanks can. To Please plus one points to us. <laughs> I think Just the point is me. that uh, something else other than payments is going to be the killer use case for identity. You can do payments without an identity framework. I've spoken a bit about it before. There's various ways of doing it. There are other things that you cannot do without an identity framework. Let's take democracy as a basic concept of voting. In order to have a democracy, you need identity. There is no way that you can do it without it. So if we take the premise that something is going to be the killer use case for identity, why are we going to argue that it's something that you can do without identity, argue that it's going to be something that you need identity, which let's take capitalism, let's take the concept of uh, democracy, let's take the concept of transferring assets rather than payments, which can be anonymous. Asset transfers can't be. There is a whole swathe of things that is going to end up being the thing that breaks the identity key or creates the identity That's, key without it being payments. Are you going to say that you can't vote because I, I don't give you a bank account? I mean, that's layering on another layer of uh, financial exclusion, right? That's exclusion from all levels of society. That's political exclusion. We know where, where voting has taken us, at least UK is a great example. But, <laughs> but, but just to get back to this, um, you know, the, the argument is that from an end consumer's point of view, uh, I, I get to vote probably once in five years. But from a, from, from a transactional point of view, I have to transact you know, five times a day for me to receive. If I'm a small merchant uh, and if I'm receiving money, I need an address and identity so that people can send money to me. And if I need to access my funds in real time and get access to those funds, do liquidity, whether I walk into an ATM yeah. or a branch, okay. I need to verify so, wait myself. Wait a minute, before we, now, because he's going to finish a thought. Funny, well, fun fact, fun twist. I want you to repeat this, but my friend, you're arguing against it. It is time for the debate to switch. Can we please have our teams switch sides? And just to remind you, no longer are Emma and Nikhil gung-ho about payments being the killer app for identity. Instead, that will be advocated by Gavin and Drew. So Nikhil, let's go back to this. Let's go back to 600 BC. <laughs> That's when... That's the first time the currency was started by the king of Lydia, when the first currency was issued. And at that point in time, there was no need for you to actually need an identity to transact value, right? Um, and then since the 600 BC in, thousand, in, in the 13th century, where the first, when the first currency and the euro was actually issued as the gold coin and this was being accepted. So it's actually historically proven that there is no need for you to have an identity to actually transact. Even in a digital space. Even in the digital space. Great example is uh, Bitcoins, right? Uh, and and with, with, the, with, with the use of tokenization as technology, there is no need for you to actually identify yourself every time when you're transacting digitally or, or offline. Uh, for example, I'm actually freaked out that if I go to Amsterdam and go to a coffee shop and spend my credit card, someone's actually watching me and they know what I'm spending at, right? I'd rather go withdraw money at the ATM and use cash. And there is really no need for me to verify myself digitally and leave a digital trace. Uh, and in today's world, the amount of data that companies are collecting, I would actually argue it's actually counterproductive for us to be using digital payments and use identity for digital When you payments. walk into the store, you're on CCTV. Don't kid yourself that you're not on the digital thread. Yes. But the only thing which has the rotation speed to enable where you've previously been anti-money laundered and KYC'd for you to go around your digital life is obviously payments. It's so obvious because without that connectivity, uh, we don't log into our pensions every day. We're not connected to our insurance unless it's once a year. Where in Maslow's well, why, hierarchy why would you of needs use anything is other payments. Than payments? Where in Maslow's hierarchy of needs is payments? 
It's the most important it's transaction. It's not there. It's not there for a really good reason. So, I mean, um, the I don't know if you have a mortgage or rent, but <laughs> I think shelter and payments are going to be reasonably intrinsically that linked. Is, that or <laughs> I think your landlord would think so, certainly. That is, that is not, so payments are not in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Things like education, things like health, factor much higher in Maslow's hierarchy Food. of needs. Identity is needed for education and for, um, and for healthcare, but they are way more important than payments. But I'm, let's, let's take Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think food's in there somewhere, isn't it? It is. So <laughs> let's take all payment forms away from you, send you out into board for a week and see how well you do. Yeah, but you Payments do is a requirement for the most with, fundamental human cash. needs. You can do that with cash. Absolutely. Let me, let, you know, we've been, you guys have been talking about all the good things that's happening in India and all the transactions <laughs> that's going on in India. The truth is, 90% of payments in India still happens in cash. So cash is still king. There is around 14 lakh crores of rupees which is still circulated in cash. In fact, 70% of all payments on e all, all orders on e-commerce is still happening on cash in India. Uh, so there's really no need for us to actually force down digital identity and force people to use digital identity to do payments because cash already does the job. And if you go to a country like Bangladesh, right, so if you think about how payments outside of cash are done somewhere like Bangladesh, they're done typically through a mobile phone. Typically the male in the household will have that mobile phone, right? So if we go payments is the killer app for identity, what we're actually doing is massively compounding a problem for women. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you there because actually women have just has just as much access and have mobile phones, so you can't blame the fact that somebody <laughs> is controlling their telecommunications device as a means of financial oppression. I call um, shenanigans, because we're seeing evidence of that fundamentally changing in emerging markets. But so I I'm gonna add, call you I on that I just wanna one. extend to what Emma is saying, that imagine I am a migrant worker and I am actually working in a different town, and my family is living in a different town, and if I had to send them money, and if that money was tied to my identity, how am I ever going to transfer value from my account to their account so that they can use that for their own So would you have a use? courier for cash? How does that work? Yeah, absolutely. Like cash can work. So I can transfer from my account to their account. So, so identity, you identity don't need here. identity to do payments. Yeah, so I think this is an interesting kicking off point for us to maybe say a few words, because it's been a challenge over the last three or four minutes or so. You're talking about the concept of sending something of value from one person to another person, and in some cases in developed economies over short distances, it's possible to do this with cash. Yes, absolutely. The title up there says payments will be the killer use case for identity. At the moment, much of what you're saying is absolutely true. The key here is that in the future, we're going to get to a world where more and more commerce is going to happen online, where geography and distances are going to become less and less important to people's lives. And when we get to that world, the need to be able to send money over distance is going to become more and more important. When we get to that stage, we need identity frameworks as a fundamental layer to be able to build payments on top of, to be able to do that. I agree that we're not there now. I agree that what's happened in India has been absolutely wonderful. The point is that in the future, it is an inevitability that money is permission. When we talk about what is money in a capitalist structure, money is the permission to do something. You give permission to an individual. You don't give permission to an inanimate object. Permission is identity, money is permission. We are going to end up inevitably in a state where an identity framework is the foundation to be able to do anything to do with payment. Drew, I'd agree with you, but... Excellent, but we're done, thank you very I, much. I would agree with you, I would <laughs> agree with you, but you know, you're limited by the technology that, that is in place today, right? No, you are, we might, we're not. No, no, we might, we might be able to build Technology, for example, Libra is a great example where you can actually achieve, uh, you know, a, a tokenization where you don't really need identity to prove who you are to actually try. I don't, I don't know if that's now, actually so the truth. Hang on wait. just a second, because it's not necessarily about identity attached to Libra. It's about the proof of permission to act and privacy constraints around that, which actually is a really fundamental question in terms of building an ID structure, yeah. is how do we manage for privacy? 
the fact of the matter is, for me to remove crypto doesn't matter. I still have permission in some way, shape, or form. It's not necessarily attached to my identity. But at a certain stage, we're going to have to worry about maintaining the anonymity of cash and moving of assets that has that sort of privacy component in, in a digital space. Oh, we should be able to achieve Now, no, hang on, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Drew, I know you want to say something. I'm going to let him say something. Let's <laughs> Libra, let's take that. The concept of Libra not needing an identity to be able to make a payment is false because it depends how you define identity. I'm saying you don't need well, identity turn, to, to, to complete a payment on Wait a minute, wait a minute. Actually, this so is a valid... use case. No, no, this you is a need, You need identity to open an account, but you, need, you don't need your identity to complete your but transaction. Actually, no, this is, is very just... fundamentally different because this is not protocol layer, this is application layer, and this is a socially constructed, artificial, non-government-sanctioned identity that I'd like Drew to actually make the point. I'm sorry I did it for you. Go. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> identity is just a set of attributes which have been attested by a third party, which there is some way of authenticating against. That is identity. We think of this in a human context where I have a name, I was born in a place, at a time, on a date, and then that constructs my identity. In the Facebook Libra context, I agree that you can divorce somebody's real-world identity from this construct of an identity framework, but you require, you absolutely require some form of an identity foundation in which to make a payment even in Libra. It's just that it might not necessarily, it is a fuzzy pseudo identity if you have your real name in there, if all of this data is correct, but there's no attestation to that. There is an attestation to the other attributes that Facebook is using to but uniquely that's, identify that's you. But that, for the, yeah, for the core drivers for that the argument you wanted me to make? The core yes, drivers of financial inclusion are the requirement for people to have a place where they can store value and transact for the things that they need. In, socii in, societies, in societies where people are uh, unable to get a bank account because they don't have a driving license or a passport or a birth certificate or they're migrant, people end up financially excluded. They find it difficult for their employers to make payments to them. So the key thing we need to enable is getting everybody set up to make payments because at that point, we'll be able to create an identity that they can then reuse for other things. No, but imagine the kind of exclusion that you would, you would, you yeah, would yeah. enforce in a large set of population if you force them to use a digital identity. Emma. So I think I mean, another use case um, where those, the two things are completely separated is the online gambling industry. Huge volumes, enormous volumes, right? In the UK, there are about 100% about of people that come through, and these are kind of broad figures, you will find that only about 60% go on to deposit. But the regulation says that you have to be able to identify who that person is to make sure that they are over 18 and for anti-money laundering reasons. Those two positions, they haven't made a payment at that point, and sometimes they may not go on to gamble. So you need to have the... Identity. Payments is not the killer app for but identity. They can't gamble without it. You, this is a. They can gamble without it. A, Have you ever done free to play? Have I you ever have done no, free to no, play? There this, you go. No, um, there, this is an association fallacy. In this example that you're using, where you have to prove your identity for anti money, anti -money laundering reasons in this gambling context, but you, that does not necessarily mean that you've paid. You cannot pay unless you've done the identity and the anti money laundering regulations. So this is an association fallacy. You've just proven that payment identity is a requirement no, to be able to do payments. No, because people can do free to play. They still but have I to be have their age verified. They ridiculous. still have to have their age verified. <laughs> they still have to have their age verified. They still have to know who they are to do free to play. Sounds Even like Even when they have made no payment. I but want to take a swing at Nickel quickly. Um, when Gavin was talking about the idea of storing value and transacting, Nickel, I don't know if you all heard, said I can do that with cash, which is interesting, very interesting. You're saying that the concept of financial inclusion is about storing value and being able to transact, and your answer is I can do that with cash. How did that work out in India before demonetization? How does that work out in Venezuela at the moment? It no, worked. you can't. You need an identity framework to be able to protect yourself, to be able to protect the populace, so that you can have financial inclusion. Financial inclusion requires protections from the macroeconomic trends that cash can create. No, so if, if let's, let's take this as an example, right? If during demonetization, thousands and millions of merchants suffered, 
right? India is actually seeing a slowdown. We are seeing secondary effects of our demonetization, which happened in 2016, that India is actually seeing an economic slowdown now today because a lot of these small merchants were not able to accept cash because there was no cash uh, in the economy and because of which they could not purchase materials from their suppliers, because of which they could not manufacture, because of which people lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. So you have the cyclic effect which is caused in the search of you know, a utopian world of digital payments. Sure, but so, that same however, period, before that, India continued to operate. Millions of more Indians have got bank accounts. Uh, it, and, 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 and you, you, you can still do financial The rate of un unified without, payments interface has gone through the roof digital identity or payments down people's throats. So yes, you're in a transition period. The rate of adoption is staggering in India of uh, adoption of digital payments. But does based it have to happen at the cost identity, of someone's life, Gavin? Are you, go, are you saying that someone's life is more <laughs> important, <laughs> you know, is any lesser than in, in achieving this thing about digital payments and someday that we will <laughs> see that the world will be a better place? Are you willing to let people die today because of that? Die, let people die because of hunger? Are you going to let people get their jobs? Uh, so is that, is that what you're saying? People are becoming financially included in, the, in India. But I'm talking about life. Because they can are get you paid. saying financial inclusion is greater than someone living life? I have, but yeah, exactly. So like, I think you're trying to say like financial, financial inclusion is not more valuable than healthcare inclusion, for example. You can't make that distinction. It's not possible to do that. But to, a, point but about to a, a certain extent, Sorry, though. The payment for the healthcare is reliant on collection of taxes which it only takes place when you have people that are financially included but they're, they're, and not we, all in cash. Kings have been collecting taxes for hundreds of years for and there was no need for identity. They weren't collecting, <laughs> it. They weren't collecting <laughs> it in India, and that's why they introduced Ask us, we've been paying taxes as India for hundreds of years. Nick, you started <laughs> off with so many years BC. I can't 2 of the population. 600, 600 yeah. BC. You started off 600 BC. I don't know what the population of the world was 600 BC. It was actually a fact. But it was probably first currency was issued. Not yeah, no, no, but in terms of scale, let's talk yeah. about seven and a half billion people exactly. versus maybe what 900 million. Again, payments will be 600 BC. I get we didn't need identity frameworks to do payments but because you knew everybody else in the world. Exactly. But right now, now in there is, and as somebody, somebody very smart and very loud told me this the other day, there's 1.3 billion people in India. <laughs> there is no way that you can provide a payment infrastructure to that scale of people, 7.5 billion people in the world. And it's a future-looking statement. That's only going to go up. We cannot have payments without this underlying identity framework. And the work that you personally did in India, which is interesting to see yourself <laughs> arguing against over here, you personally <laughs> spent your career building this India stack framework to allow people to have financial inclusion, but it to make, make the world the a better app. place. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's going to be the killer app. Absolutely, framework. Emma, you're right. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's going to be the killer app. Let me it actually. It, it, you, I just don't think you can kind of wait and go, you know, financial inclusion is more, you know, more then what important no, I than actually want to throw, I actually possible. want to throw okay. another spanner hey, into this hey, debate. Well, I, I, I have I one final what? question because we're running out of time. And frankly, I want to point one final thing out for us to consider in the next five minutes because we still have to have you give your actual personal take on this. Oh, I think sure. the whole point of this is to explore from every side. Sure. Let's actually talk about this as a global standard because right now we are sitting in an environment where we have agreed upon a number of standards and protocols and practices that, have, that payments are in every country treated similarly. That there is a standard and interoperability framework that works fairly seamlessly. Collaboration between payments and specifically the identity component, because it's not just the banking industry that determines what that looks like, actually may be a fundamental challenge. I think for the final question, can we actually overcome interoperability questions? Can we, come, can we overcome cultural relative issues and identity is a localized question? to set a standard. standard. Can, now, can I, can I, can I just have one last point. Oh, my Please, God. last point. You can, you can share it, you can share it. No, no, just on the against. against. Yes. Oh, yes, if you can argue against yourself, do it now. Do it, bring it. Right, so I, I just want to bring this point that I believe that payments and identity have to be unbundled from each other. And for a long time, we have been arguing identity or payments always from a human point of view. Let me give you an example. India has a payment system called uh, fast tag, which is essentially a payment system for vehicles, right? 
and, and we can actually, it's got nothing to do with the person. It's actually a payment system for the vehicle. And essentially, there is nothing to do with me as a person. I can actually put a tag How on my car, zip through, to a, pay the bill? zip through a toll road, and it's got nothing to do with me. How does the vehicle earn the money to pay the bill? Vehicles have owners. It is the owner that has the money that's making I can the payment top up that, that with has cash. an identity. <laughs> I can top that up with cash, and I don't have to give up my identity to actually top that instrument up. So I, well, the point that I'm trying to make is, let's not forget, let's not try to go into this world where payments is only linked to humans. Payments can actually also be linked to this chair. Payments can be linked to a, you know, an IOE we've, box that's sitting out there. So we fundamentally anthropomorphized everything, especially in a digital context. Global standards. Actually, quite fair, quite fair. Global All right. Standards. I want us to have one final opportunity to, to true up what we've been discussing. I think he might have <laughs> suspected there is a particular bias towards a side on, in some cases. There's a natural bias, <laughs> especially since one is been building the actual system that he's <laughs> argued about for years. Let's actually, let's level set this. Where do you personally think? And thank you, by the way, for covering it from every single aspect and for attacking the argument as it's supposed to be. We cannot have platitudes and, and tweets discussing this. This has to actually, this has to be robust and I appreciate you all bringing an incredibly robust argument to stage. Emma? Where do you actually think payments and identity converge? Is this where we're going? Do you believe it will be a killer app in the future for identity? Uh, I think payments are important, uh, an important use case to identity, but I think um, I, if we look at somewhere like Sweden, um, payments wasn't the killer app for for identity in Sweden, you know, for people to start using it. You know, bank ID was ubiquitous before something like Swish came in. Um, and so, and I think for all of those use cases, when we look at healthcare, when we look at education, they are incredibly important. And I, and I think that um, they need to be developed outside of, um, you know, a, the payments use case. You know, they're very separate. Um, the attributes that are within those use cases have you know different privacy constraints, different views from a it's consumer perspective. It's not a silver bullet. It's just not a silver it's bullet. It's not a silver bullet. Nikhil, silver uh, bullet. <laughs> no, I, I think you know one of the things that people don't realize is identity systems don't actually have robust authentication systems built in, and which is why you have not seen uh, payments being a killer use case in many different countries. Because you know, for example, the social security number in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is has no authentication layer. Mm -hmm. uh, so the point is, if you have a strong ID, digital identity system, which has an authentication system, uh, then you can enable a number of use cases on top of it. And purely from a daily active use case point of view, payments becomes a killer app. Uh, I believe the future of payment switches are going to be data switches. Because when you move money digitally, you're actually moving bits of data from one application to another application. Um, and the transaction type is actually a payment type. Transaction type is equal to payment. Transaction type can be equal to check balance. Transaction type is equal to fetch statement. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, if you're able to authenticate a user and verify the request, you can deliver a number of services and not limit yourself to payment. So basically, identity is the unlocking for every other type of transaction. Absolutely. So identity has if to come If we are first. able to build a user-first, easy to use, digital identity and an authentication system. In fact, in India, with UPI, we've actually done the reverse, mm -hmm. where we've built a user-friendly mobile payment system, which also enables people to access their data from their banking systems. Um, so it, it all comes down to the authentication system. If you can design an authentication system which is unbundled from a use case, then you can build any use case on top, on top of, of it. it. So identity, become, identity is not a chicken and egg question. It's identity first. Yes. Drew. Uh, I believe that the answer is no, that payments won't be the killer use case for identity uh, for a few reasons. Number one, uh, I'm very glad that we ended on this side because that actually is, is uh, I've been able to get out all of my arguments early on. Um, 
Payments need to remain anonymous bearer instrument in order for the world to continue to function as a democracy. I think that there's fundamental things to us existing as a society, which means that payments needs to be able to exist outside of, any, outside of our own identity framework. I do think that there will be something else that is the killer use case for identity. That when we say the killer use case for identity, I think it's important what we mean here is we get to a global interop interoperable standard of individual attributes, attestations, and authorizations. I think that's what we mean by the killer use case for identity. I don't think it will be payments, but I do think it will be something along, it will need to be something along the lines of uh, healthcare, something along the lines of voting, something along the lines of, um, let's go with healthcare and voting, that will end up being the thing that makes us get to where we need to get to. I think that payments has driven us to where we are now because it is the most liquid and obvious way of looking at incentive alignment. Like, we understand that adopting a global ID system isn't a technical challenge. I mean, the numbers that Nicola have been spouting has proven the technology is possible. But it is a political, a stakeholder, a regulatory and an ethical challenge, which means that we need to align the incentives of the humans to be able to get there. And payments is an obvious incentive alignment because everybody understands that that's a liquid thing but it's only going to get us so far, and what's actually going to tip us over the balance is going to be something that has less financial value and more social value. Travel is a potential use case in terms of identity mobility is also sure, something some, to think Somebody should build a travel stack in India, that'd be cool. That would be interesting. Yeah. Gavin, I think as... I don't have an answer here. <laughs> I thought I was going to end the debate with a very clear point of view, but I haven't got there. Um, I guess... Uh, when we're born, I mean, most countries have some register of uh, births and marriages and deaths and that sort of thing. When we're born, we're issued with a, a birth certificate of some description. In this country we are, in the UK. Um, if we're able to take a biometric identity and issue it to every person that's born and say, here is something that you can take with you through life that enables you to access the services you need I think that might work extremely well as long as you always couple it to uh, a data protection act as they're doing in India or as they've done in Australia with a customer data right or with GDPR. I think the two things have to go together. In the absence of doing it properly, payments is probably the next best thing. So where I am is if, uh, if we haven't done the thing, done a really good job on this, then at least having somewhere where the identity has been checked by a regulated institution where you have a fast rotation speed and you're constantly connected to it, logging in, making payments, reconfirming your identity at every stage, that's probably the go-to place until you do it properly. That's probably my closing remark. Payments so, is a means to an end, not the end. I think we've had an opportunity to really uncover just how difficult a question this is to answer. And I want to thank each of you, Gavin, Drew, Kiel, Emma, for showcasing that. What it comes down to is we can talk all we want about identity, and we can talk all we want about how banking fits in there and how we're a natural player, but we have to roll it back just a little bit. This is not about money, and this is not about payments. Again, thank you, Drew, for highlighting it. It's about permission, and permission to do and act and engage. And identity is very much an existential thing. We've tried to componentize it and to attribute it. And to a certain extent, we've managed it. But we've got a lot more to go. And for us to flippantly decide that we have a, uh, the main stake in determining what that looks like is a bit of a fallacy. On the other hand, we play a critical role in helping shape the future of what identity is. And quite frankly, the future of this entire industry is about identity as a service. And in some way, shape, or form, we will be providing that. I want each of you, I want to thank all of you. Please, please thank them with me for doing this in just a moment because I have a reminder about drinks in about uh, 20 minutes. They'll be here to answer your questions. They will engage in vicious debate. And the loudest one will be Nikhil, and so we'll put him in the corner. Fair? Thank you very much for sticking around. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated.